there we go we are live and good afternoon everyone and thanks for joining us we move out of the way here uh i am ryan the digital services librarian for genesee district library and i'm here with chris and sherry and nancy for our uh seasonal edition of what are you reading where we'll talk about different books that we read recently and what we recommend how are all three of you doing great doing good <laughs> uh let's see so this is our, our first one we've done now since our our december gift buying guide that was a lot of fun i was just looking at all our art for that that was really neat and even though it's you know uh we're not buying probably gifts it's still a lot of good stuff in there so take a look at that video you want to go back and uh watch i think it's one of the best ones that we've done it's really great all right so we have a lot of books to talk about i'm sure because we haven't done this in, in a little while um we can just dive right into it we'll talk about our recommendations and or things we read recently what we liked about them and chris do you want to start us off oh sure um so it's good to be back uh, as i was going through my notes of what i've read it was like oh oh what am i gonna oh what am i gonna pick so the first one I picked is called The Road from Belhaven by Margot Livesay. Um, this is a book that covers a wide range of topics from historical to, to gothic to romance. Um, I picked it to read uh, because it was set in Scotland um, and it takes place in the 19th century. I love the cover. <laughs> it's just so like, oh, I want to read this book. Um, the Scotland part was also like a big draw for me and the fact that it's historical fiction primarily. So the main character is Lizzie Craig, who lives with her grandparents, and she um, has the gift of seeing the future. So as you imagine, in the late 19th century, um, this gift is probably something she shouldn't broadcast because of all the stigma around having um, supernatural gifts. So anyway, the story follows her coming of age and how she handles her sporadic visions. Um, her visions aren't such that, you know, she can foresee the future. She can just see it. And she hasn't ever been able to, like, change the outcome. So anyway, she meets a young man who um, heavily influences a lot of her choices, thus the coming of age. Um, at times, I wanted to strangle her. Uh, because she was so worried about what other people thought that it just kind of drove me bonkers. And um, because she was so worried about what other people thought, she got caught in lies and made a lot of poor choices. So that being said, <laughs> um, there were several likable characters, side characters that I really liked who supported her and helped her get through these lies and poor choices um, essentially, they helped her get her through, get her through her difficulties. Um, what I really enjoyed about the book was the setting in Scotland, um, the depiction of life in Scotland in the late 1800s. Um, I think anybody who likes uh, those kinds of things will like this book. Um, if you like historical fiction, if you like romance, you'll definitely enjoy this story. Um, it's just a little book. It's only 272 pages. Um, the GDL has two print copies, so if you want it, you, you better get out there and request it. <laughs> Seems like a, a quick read then. Uh, do they ever explain or delve into why she has these visions at all, or is that something that's just kind of there um, to make it part of the Yes, it's a plot? family, it's a family trait. So okay. I think it's her grand and also eventually reveals to her grandmother that she has this okay interesting cool thank you chris sherry let's go with you next what do you want to talk about um i want to talk about keeper of the hidden books by madeline martin um it's All historical right. fiction um it takes place in 1939 poland um so zofia is a teen girl she's living in warsaw in 1939 and she loves books um, she also has a best friend, Janina, who she's super close with. Um, when the Nazis invade Warsaw, Zofia and Janina get jobs at the library and find themselves hiding books from the Nazis, as well as having a secret book club of books that Hitler has deemed bad. Um, so as things get worse in Poland and Jews, including Janina, are forced into the Warsaw ghetto, 
Um, Zofia is in a fight to save both her friend and the books. It's pretty clear the author did a lot of research into this time period. Um, if, expect an unbreakable friendship, a secret book club, and a secret library. Um, true events that surround the Warsaw Library. Um, and at the end of the book, the author talks about which parts of the story are true. Um, acts of kindness and bravery, and make sure you have tissues close by. Um, I thought this one was a little scary in how similar events in this book are to what's going on today with the banning of the books. Um, so I found it really interesting in that aspect too. Um, I was going to mention that it seems like it could be really relevant to today. So I'll ask you a, a different question is when I always, you know, look at books about World War II and Nazis, uh, I'm always intrigued. Like the, the, the idea behind this book is intriguing to me, but it's also a part of me is like, well, how depressing is it? <laughs> how, like, how, where, where does it kind of fall in there? Is it, it for me, it's hard to, to read books about, I, I you know, I read a it lot. It is difficult. I've read quite a bit about World War II, and I, I've learned quite a bit that I didn't know. Um, but yeah, it's definitely one that's a little disturbing. Um, it goes through the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising um, during that time frame. Um, it goes through how the people in Warsaw fought thinking that the Russians would save them while they just sat on the other side of the river and watched them get slaughtered. So it is a little disturbing. Um, but there are- I think it's good for us to, to, to talk about those things, but I always kind of like to go into it with uh, just knowing ahead of time to prepare <laughs> myself to, you know. Right. All right. Well, thanks, Sherry. All right, Nancy, what do you want to talk about first? I read, uh, I read so much. I was like, Chris, it was hard to pick because since December, I've probably read 20 or 30 books already. Um, the one that I'm talking about today is Sword Catcher by Cassandra Clare. This is her first adult novel. Um, I know you know Cassandra Clare. Everybody reads her. This is the Chronicles of Castellane, the first book in that series. Um, it talks about two um, protagonists. It's okay. Um, <clears throat> one of them is an orphan, and the king's um, the king selects him to be a body double for the prince because he looks a lot like the prince. So he becomes the prince's sword catcher. He's offered a very good life um, away from poverty, but he also has to be ready to die for the prince at any time. And next, there's a woman called Lynn Castor, and she's a member of the Oshkar community. Um, who possess magical abilities. By law, they're a second tier citizen. They must live behind the walls of the city. Um, she's a physician though, so she ventures out to tend the sick in the city of Castellane. So this book moves really slow. I wanted to give up on it, but I was reading it. Uh, I was listening to it. It was an audiobook, So I kept going and I'm glad I did. It got a lot better. Um, Kel and Lynn meet up and then things really start happening. Um, there are forces at work that are trying to take the prince out, a lot of political intrigue, a lot of fantasy with the magic, and it's a really good Cassandra Clare book. I don't know if it won, but I know it was nominee for Best Fantasy in 2023, and I believe it won. Um. The cover of this one was really caught me. It's, it's such an interesting, I don't know, it, it's, it looks so great. I guess you want to pick it up and start reading it. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Have you read um, Cassandra Clare's other books? Or is this your first one of hers? You started? I haven't read her teen fiction, but she's so well published and well thought of. Um, yeah, I have not yet. I don't know why. Well, maybe you'll have to know. <laughs> yeah, definitely. All right. Thanks, Nancy. All right. Chris, what is up next for you? Um, what I picked um, next um, is just another small book. <laughs> it's an 85 page tribute uh, that really packs a punch. Um, while it presents as almost a picture book, the subject matter is a heavy hitter. Um, it's the story of Matthew Shepard, 
And if you don't remember, he was a young gay man who was brutally murdered in October of 1998. His story was covered in the media quite in extensively. And this little book is kind of a memorial tribute to him. Um, it shares pieces of his life as a young boy leading up to his death. Um, there are historical notes. Um, there's some extensive uh, letters and notes from the author and the illustrator uh, that share what this book represents. Um, in addition, the epilogue and the foreword provide some additional insight and history. I feel like this book is a must read uh, from cover to cover. Uh, the, the illustrations are exquisite um, that once I finished reading it, I had to go back and just sit in, in the moment with each um, picture, each illustration, because um, partially this is a story, uh, for me anyway, that kind of hit home. Uh, when it came, when Matthew Shepard was murdered, my son, I was pregnant with my son and he was like, I was gonna give birth to him in like two months. And it just really hit hard to me that somebody, that people wanted to kill someone for who they are. And it was hard to be a pregnant lady with a, a boy thinking that like, oh my gosh, why do people want to hurt other people? Um, I'm sorry to get so emotional, but um, you know, this was 25 years ago and it's, it's, it hurts me to think that we haven't come and gotten better about treating people um, with, you know, love and kindness. So I think that um, this is a really good book uh, to read, um, to give you a feeling for what it's like uh, to be a family member of someone who is treated so poorly. And in his case, he was murdered, brutally murdered. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for, no, th thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And it's a, it's a great recommendation. Yeah, I do wanna show just if I can. Yeah, um, certainly one of the little illustrations and it's the little, you know, it's little hand when he was a child. Um, and it just kind of gives you an example of how I just wanted to open each page and just kind of sit with those illustrations um, and, and think about them and kind of digest them. And it's really, you know, I think this book is a testament to what books, how books can make you feel and have you think about, um, you know, things that aren't in necessarily right immediately in your life. Thank you so much. That's a great, uh, you, you covered it all. I've nothing to ask. I think that was uh, a, a really great recommendation to check out. We have a copy at the Fenton Library, I assume. Yes. Yeah. And so there we go. And probably other branches as well. Thank you, Chris. All right, Sherry, what do you want to talk about next? Um, my next book is The Wishing Game by Meg Schaefer. Um, not really sure how to categorize this one, so I'll just kind of delve into what it's about. So Jack Masterson is the reclusive author of a popular children's book series, the Clock Island series. And years ago, he stopped writing, disappointing all his fans. Now he's ready to write again, and he's decided to hold a contest for his most devoted readers. Um, they get to go to the real Clock Island, which is where he lives, and win the only copy of his new book. Lucy's one of those readers. She's currently a teacher's aide who wants to adopt Christopher, who's an orphaned former student of hers. But unfortunately, she doesn't have the money to take care of him or the housing situation to take care of him. But this contest could be her shot. Um, the contest involves solving riddles, playing games, and facing their fears. This one was just so sweet. The characters were so endearing. The story was kind of whimsical, and it's the perfect book to remind us of our favorite childhood books. Um, this one had kind of a vibe of maybe Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, but for me, it reminded me most of The Westing Game, which was one of my favorite books when I was a kid. It's just, it's very sweet. Um, there's like four people competing. It's just a lot of fun. And it was a really fast read too. I think the 
the Westing game comparison is pretty interesting. That I think is a, a good hook for a lot of people. Um, yeah, it seems like a pretty fun book. I don't know. I am kind of intrigued. Thanks, Sherry. Uh, Nancy, what do you want to read next? Or what do you want to talk about next? I assume you've already read it. What do you want to talk about? Yes. Um, I read such a good one, The Stranger Upstairs by Lisa Matlin. And I would classify this as a domestic thriller. One thing about domestic thrillers is I read them really fast because I can't put them down because I have to know what happened. So this starts out with a social media influencer. Um, she has quite a few followers and she decides to buy a Victorian home in disrepair. It's a murder house. Um, a man murdered his family. A daughter was spared. She ran down the road and asked for help, but the rest of the family was murdered in this house. And she decides to combine those things, um, her social media influence, the fact that this is an old house she wants to fix up, and the fact that it's a murder sensation uh, into creating another site for this home and its repairs. So she sinks all of her money into this house and her and her husband move in. And right away, she figures out that things are not quite right. Um, the plumber has problems, things happen, things break, things come undone. Um, and then she goes deeper into it and she realizes it looks like there's somebody keeping time up in the attic. So she gets all involved with that. And this is maybe halfway through the book and everything starts to happen at once and you just can't put it down. And it is one of the best endings um, that I've read in a while. And I think I will say this, if you love Poe, it ends in a similar situation to one of the Poe books. So this book is just, so good and you kind of see her spiraling um the more problems that she runs into with this house nothing good ever happens in an attic i feel like it's a good one it's a good thriller <laughs> what so I've, I've never heard the term i'm surprised i guess i've never heard like a domestic thriller before so is that just i guess can you describe it what is it what is a domestic thriller um, it seems to me a lot of the 30-somethings, I watch a lot of YouTube and a lot of the 30-somethings like the domestic thrillers, it will be like a man and a woman or, and something's taking place at home or in their neighborhood, uh, right where they live, at a school. It's something that's close to home and it's a thriller. It's usually really creepy. And it just has you on edge the whole book to figure out what's going on. All right. Excellent. Thank you, Nancy. All right, Chris, what is your last book for today? So my last book is Simply the Best by Susan Elizabeth Phillips. Um, funny, kind of little funny side note. This isn't my typical MO. <laughs> I was going on vacation with my family and I put it on hold thinking I would give it to my daughter to read. And sure enough, she read it first and she said, mom, you got to read this. So I'm like, ah, OK, I'll read it. I'm going on vacation. I, you know, I need something like this. So that being said, it's a delightful romp through the Midwest from Chicago to the northern wilds of Michigan. Um, this is a cute rom-com with a murder thrown in for a twist. The dialogue is fun. There's even a cameo of the Michigan insurrectional, insurrectionists. For better or for worse, they're in there. <laughs> so um, this is actually the 10th story in the Chicago Stars series. And um, I, I think when I got it, I knew it was Chicago Stars, but I absolutely knew nothing about what this series was going to be, except that um, it's somewhat sports related. So it's quite capable of um, standing on its own as a read alone. You don't have to read the others, the other nine in front of it. Um, and this is the story of Brett Rivers. He's a successful sports agent who happens to bump into Rory Garrett, um, who is the sister of his biggest client. And his biggest client is a star quarterback for the Chicago Stars, thus taking place in Chicago. So anyway, it's a messy story uh, with lots of ups and downs, um, a little bit of venture, uh, lots of humor. 
uh, lots of description of um, owning a food truck. Uh, I really enjoyed this book <laughs> because of it, it was really nice and light. Uh, my only complaint is the constant angst of the main character. And funny that Nancy men mentioned the 30-year-olds because the main character, I think, is like 33 in this book. She's not married. Um, she's kind of been the um, underdog in her family, the one who was expected to not be a success. She's lived in the shadow of her quarterback star brother. Um, so her angst just kind of, you know, annoyed me a little bit. Um, because at 33, I was not angsty. You know what I mean? <laughs> anyway, so fortunately, that angst resolves itself by the end of the story. And, um, you know, it was definitely enjoyable. So I would recommend this to any reader who likes food fiction, who likes romance, um, who likes, you know, sports. Uh, it, it was really enjoyable. I liked it. I think more rom-coms should have a murder involved, and I think you could really bring in the, to a different audience. Also, I like a little worried. I hope like the Michigan insurrectionist plot and the murder aren't like the same plot. I don't know. I would have never thought those would be two things going on uh, when I looked at the cover of this book. Uh, <laughs> that's that, that's not where I thought it was going to go. So I'm I'm pretty intrigued. I think that's a, a great sell for this book. If anybody is watching this, you should check it out. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. It's, I mean, it's fun just to, to get to that part with the Michigan insurrectionists <laughs> because, because again, you're like, oh, oh, <laughs> that's, I imagine, I don't know much about this author, but I imagine that was her little dig. You know what I mean? <laughs> anyway. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Sherry, what do you want to talk about for your last book? The last one I want to talk about is Dark Fable by Catherine Harbour. It's listed as teen fiction, but the characters are all young adults, so I'm going to call it new adult. I really <laughs> liked it. It was my first five-star read of the year, and the cover is gorgeous. Um, so Evie Wilder is good at hiding. Um, she squats in an apartment and works multiple jobs to straight by, and nobody seems to notice her. While she's working a catering job, she gets caught in the middle of a heist and finds out that she can become invisible. The crew of thieves, five of them in all, approach her to become a member of La Fabla Sombre or Dark Fable, which is a legendary group of thieves. Um, they've existed throughout history. They've been involved in several historical thefts, so it kind of adds a little bit of historical fiction to this one. And as she becomes enmeshed in their world of powers, because all of them have like some sort of power like she does, and wealth, um, she realizes that the group's leaders, mother and father, are might hold some secrets to her past. Um, it's kind of dark. It has really amazing world building. Um, the characters are morally gray, but I found them likable. There's a lot of twists and turns. And I'm hoping there's a sequel coming. Um, well, looking up this one on Goodreads, I saw a few people complained about how descriptive things were. She did go into a lot of description, um, but I really felt like it added to the story, didn't take anything away from me. So I like you mentioned it was your first five star book of the year. I, yes. On average, if you had to guess, how many five star books do you think you read? Um, maybe four or five a year. Okay, so that's that's really good then. That's that's pretty yes. good. <laughs> what, what what do you look for in a five star book? What is something that you would really want a five star book to have? Um, I just really want it to grab my attention and make me not want to put it down, but also make me think as well. And this one had a lot of that. All right. You know, when you asked her that, I was kind of curious. I had to go back in my Goodreads to see how many five stars. When, <laughs> when was my last five star? And would you know, I've given out five, five stars since January 1st. <laughs> wow. Pretty Fancy. good year so, so far. Well, I guess. I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> That's interesting. That doesn't usually happen for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Sherry. All right, Nancy, you get to close us out here. What is your last book for today? All right. I read kind of a grim one. I read historical fiction about the Warsaw Ghetto. <laughs> uh, this one's called We Must Not Think of Ourselves by Lauren Grodstein. And... Um, 
it's a good story though. It shows the perseverance of the people. It does show the hardship and what they endured. And it also showed how manipulative it was that Germany got the people into the ghetto. Um, it started in such small increments until they were all the way in there and couldn't get out. And then there were shootings and there were food rationing, severe food rationing. Um, the the um, conditions were horrible. There was typhus. Um, it just got worse and worse, which we know it did. And we know the culmination, what it led up to. So just the progression of all of that. It was very depressing. It was a good story, though. It mostly centered on uh, one of the characters was Adam Pascal, and he is a teacher. He's a college professor, and he's in there, and he joins some activists and does some um, activist work, and that's very interesting. And also he teaches German and English to the kids while they're all in the ghetto together. Um, there's not a lot to do there. So um, it's interesting. They each find things to do to make their lives meaningful. Um, his apartment is, he's kind of tricked into giving up his apartment. His father-in-law is wealthy and he's playing both sides and he gets Adam to give up his apartment. Um, his apartment is intended for the Germans to stay in. And he says, oh, I've got this better apartment for you to stay in over here. So when he walks to the door with his wheelbarrow full of his belongings, there's three other families who've also been promised that apartment. So 14 people are living in this apartment and it shows their daily life. And actually they're kind of a comfort to each other. He actually, um, his wife has died three years pre pre uh, previously, prior to the war. And he actually falls in love while he's in the ghetto. But um, his main project, what he wants to do with other people is interview people while they're all together and take everyone's statements, their thoughts on the war, um, what they do for daily life, just kind of um, a diary of life in the ghetto. And this is actually inspired by a testimony gathering project, a real life one called Oneg Shabbat. Um, and this is a living document. There were three of them written Two of them were buried in milk jugs underneath the streets of the ghetto. And the third one was buried, but it was never found. So um, it just kind of led me to dig a little more into the history of that time and um, what this diary was all about. So it was a really good book. Uh, it sounds like it. It sounds pr pretty heavy, um, but very interesting. Um, we should have ended on the wishing game, I feel like. I think now we have this really yes. heavy. <laughs> it was good. But I think that's always the theme. I always that's always I feel like the theme of what are you, well, that's what connects all of us is we seem to enjoy books that are uh, kind of like that, but, you know, challenging and maybe a little heavy. Um, but we also like a variety, so that, that's pretty good. Thank you for sharing that with us, Nancy. All right, anything anyone like to say before we, we head out? We'll be back in the summer. Uh, check your program guide, the 19, at any of our branches on our website, the gdl.org. You can find out when. And we'll we'll head out for now. And everyone have a nice afternoon. Thanks for watching. Take See you care. later. Bye. Bye. <laughs>